If a team of knife-wielding lunatics in dime store Halloween masks started picking off everyone around you as part of a poorly thought-out revenge scheme, what would you do? Once again, some nutcase, and or nutcases, decided to pick up the torch and go around murking people for some ridiculous reason. Never mind the fact that everyone who's attempted this so far has died horribly without achieving their ultimate goal. Nah, I'm sure this time around, our villains totally have it in the bag. You see, these guys are motivated by revenge, which totally hasn't been done before in the franchise. Oh wait, well, whatever. I'm sure it'll be fine. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat Ghostface in Scream 6. Film studies professor Laura Crane's got a hot date, so she thinks. Evidently, her leading man wasn't all that blessed in the intelligence department, which is why he somehow can't find his way to the bar despite living in a world where Google Maps, Waze, and stopping to ask for directions are all things that exist. Then again, this is New York, so that last one probably wouldn't go so well. Either way, it doesn't matter, because instead of focusing 100% of his walnut-sized brain on finding his way there, Reggie seems far more concerned with chatting Laura up about her class on slasher films. That's right, Goldilocks here is considered an ex expert on the genre. Although, if that's the case, I gotta say, I'm surprised she'd leave the densely populated bar and walk straight into the nearest kill zone after Numbnut said he saw a man with a knife. And apparently, I'm not the only one. You teach a class about slashers, and you still walked into a dark alley, alone. That's not funny. <laughs> It's kind of funny. I mean, you wouldn't exactly have to be Alfred Hitchcock to realize going in there is a bad idea. But nah, I get it. She had to try and save that random idiot she's barely talked to once. Except there was nothing that would indicate he was even down there in the first place. And the way those romance scams are taken off, dude might have not even been on the same continent. Besides, what exactly was she gonna do to help him? A college professor in New York? No way she was armed with anything more than a Twitter profile. Of course, once Reggie started using his big boy voice, we should have hightailed it out of there as fast as our heels could carry us, which granted probably isn't all that fast, but it's better than standing around waiting to get perforated. Instead, she let herself get distracted by a few punks horsing around nearby and totally forgot about the pitch black side alley right in front of her. You know, the one you'd have to be absolutely insane to linger beside for any amount of time. A grown man at a dead sprint could clear that distance almost as fast as you can physically react. Although, as dense as this chick was, he probably could have casually walked up and stabbed her through the eye socket while she was asking why he brought a knife to their first date. What a fun story for their future grandkids. <sighs> Well, this is just great. Now I gotta find someone else to follow around through the rest of this dumpster fire. Oh, well, I guess this guy will have to do. <clears throat> Jason is a bit of a movie buff. Take a guess which kind is his favorite. Anyway, when he's not out catfishing people to death, he takes film classes at the local university, which is where he first laid eyes on her Vic here. That'll teach her for giving him a C-. minus. Although, judging by all the mistakes he's about to make, I'd say the below average marks and slasher class are probably warranted. For starters, he ditches the mask while hovering over the still warm remains of the woman he just brutally murdered, which in the age of ubiquitous CCTV and the self-imposed surveillance state is as good as writing his name on her forehead. Not only that, but it's currently spooky season. Just take a look at all the other 20-somethings gallivanting around in costume. Hitting the town as Ghostface wouldn't look out of place at all, and given Jason's knowledge of the local party scene, we could easily pop into a rager, change clothes in the bathroom, and split without anybody noticing. He also leaves his robe lying right next to the body, which would almost certainly have soaked up some amount of skin cells and or hair follicles the police could use to nail his down the road. Sure, he might not be in the system yet, but if he ends up becoming a suspect, all it would take is a DNA sample to end his kill streak for good. Better to just stuff it in a plastic bag for now and then have it incinerated as soon as possible, along with literally everything else he wore out here tonight. And that goes double for the blood splattered mask. Like, I get why he'd want to hold on to it. I really do. It's got that sentimental value you simply can't replace. But much like my friend, 
first YouTube play button, it all just starts collecting dust once you kill enough people. Of course, where Jason really goes wrong is his decision to partner up with another stab enthusiast in the form of his roommate, Greg. Seriously, these two are supposed to be diehard fans of the actual murderers around which the film series is based. You'd think they would have realized that almost every time two people put on the mask, they wound up turning on each other, including the very first case with Billy and Stu themselves. And by the sound of it, old Greg is planning to keep the tradition alive. Do you know warmer, colder? Warmer. You're on fire. Well, looks to me like he's getting colder by the second. Yeah, probably should have taken the prank call routine a little more seriously. Especially once he started walking him to the fridge. I mean, come on. Do you really think anyone would actually be hiding in there? We'd be able to hear him talking through the door for Christ's sake. Obviously, it's either gonna be Greg's mangled remains or a simple distraction to turn your attention away from the real threat. Or, in this case, both. No matter how you slice it, Jason should have known something like this might happen to him someday. If not from Greg deciding he wanted to be the star of their little horror show, then from some other group of lunatics believing the role truly belonged to them. Dude struck me as the kind of guy that posts random Slipknot lyrics at 3 in the morning, and given the sheer amount of carelessness he showed back at the crime scene, it's not unreasonable to think someone might have sussed him and his roommate out as potential copycats and tracked them down. Knowing this, he should have adopted a healthy level of extreme paranoia the moment he decided this is what he wanted out of life. Anyone who's paid attention to the whole ghost face racket would know that you're walking into a confusing world of copycats, purists, revenge factions, and the like who all think they're the rightful heirs to the brand. It's just not worth it if you ask me. Especially when the whole thing comes down to what? A knife? A mask? Some voice changer thing? And a whole bunch of dumb rules that don't make any sense. It's just so uninspired. I mean, have we really become so creatively bankrupt as a society that even our serial killers cannot come up with something new? Compare this with the work of Brian Morgan from Dexter. Even Brad from Do Not Reply came up with inventive scenarios for his slangs. And wait, where was I going with this? Well, whatever. The point is that because Jason didn't take his supposed friend's scary voice call seriously and immediately armed himself with a third hole drilled SBR before backing himself into a corner, now I have to find yet another character to shadow. Although, I'm definitely thinking the third time's the charm. Did get through the last one after all. Alright, here we go. Ahem, <clears throat> Samantha Carpenter is a Oron. After surviving her phony baloney ex-boyfriend's attempt at rebooting the franchise, she followed her younger sister Tara to a city full of violent criminals where she mothers her relentlessly without doing jack to actually protect her. Case in point, moving them into an apartment with a wildly promiscuous unvetted roommate who brings home a new guy almost every night. Meaning, if you're a psycho who wants to track down OG Ghostface's daughter for some reason, all you have to do is fog a mirror and be a male, and you're pretty much in. Of course, that would require you to know she's in town in the first place. Oh, but don't worry, Samantha doesn't exactly keep a low profile. If she's not zapping the occasional scumbag for getting handsy with her sister, you can almost certainly catch her outside trying to throw down with every soda-slinging sidewalk troll who brings up her past, which is exactly how we wind up with this ugly exchange. Hey, yo, yo, Murderer! Oh, yeah. What? You no, she clearly wants to be your best friend. Look, I get not taking off anyone lest you become a human doormat. But when you've already got a world-renowned reputation for being an unhinged maniac, outbursts like that don't do you any favors. You see, despite being cleared of all the wrongdoings for what went down with her ex, she got completely hosed in the court of public opinion. According to the internet, Sam murdered Richie in cold blood after setting him up as a patsy. And wouldn't you know it, the truth is still slipping its loafers on. Knowing this, it probably wasn't such a great idea to remain glued to her little sister and potentially draw her into the crossfire whenever someone decides to carry out a little street justice. Fact is, while her actions were justifiable, the inevitable out-of-context clip of Sam's response to the Coca-Cola drive-by will almost certainly be going viral, which is definitely not the kind of attention they need right now. And unfortunately for Sam, it couldn't have happened at a worse possible time, because guess whose driver's license was found at 
Chase and Greg's blood splattered apartment. It's unclear whether or not this detail was relayed to the girls at this point, but the end result is Detective Bailey of the NYPD asking Sam to come down to the station. And yeah, that. I'm not saying we should immediately fake our own deaths, but if we're so important to their investigation that they want to bring us in for an interview, they can send a patrol car over to provide us with an armed escort. After all, Tara happened to be friends with the departed, and given everything they've been through, the last thing an intelligent person would do is risk an unnecessary walk in the middle of the night where they could be ambushed. Oh, right, I forgot what we're dealing with here. And apparently, so did Sam. You and Tara better watch your back. You better watch your yours. No, I think you should probably watch your back too. And that starts by not answering phone calls when you know the person on the other side is just going to try and with you. Like, you're already familiar with the standard ghost face MO. He's not calling to say hi. He's not going to give you any kind of useful information. He's just trying to keep you distracted long enough to pounce on you, which is exactly what happens. Tara's just lucky he went for the quintessential women's self-defense class grab attack instead of planting that buck knife in the back of her skull like a competent psychopath. We should have turned back and holed up in her apartment the second we saw Richie's face pop up on the screen. Now, our only chance is to duck into the nearest bodega and hope there's at least one person in there who decided to make survival their personal responsibility. Seriously, in a post-Bruin world, there's absolutely no reason why Samantha couldn't be appendix carrying a full-frame handgun right now, even in New York. She's been living here long enough to jump through all the necessary legal hoops, and given Sam was ready to flee the state the moment they heard about Jason and Greg catching the unalive, you'd think she'd be wary enough to think about this ahead of time. Instead, or left to prey one of these halfwits is not only packing heat, but also the brains to use it effectively. Hey! Holy sh dude, you just saw someone brutally murder two men right in front of you. That's about as imminent and deadly as imminent and deadly threats can possibly get. Right there, you had the green light to plant some federal flight control in this freak show, and yet you still warned him so he could dive out of the way at the last second. Oh, uh, well, that shouldn't be a problem as long as Dante Hicks remembers his shotgun is in fact a shotgun and maintains his position of dominance behind the counter to play a little buckshot whack-a-mole. Right now, the girl should either be roadie running under his line of sight, out the door, or ducking down beside him while they get 911 on the phone. But of course, you know that's not gonna happen. Uh-uh. Our hero has to immediately nullify every ounce of advantage he has and walk right up to the aisles in pursuit of the fleeing felons, which is exactly why this happens. <laughs> Dumb. Stupid. Dumb. You had it all, and you blew it. That said, Sam and Tara didn't exactly do him any favors by pestering him for the keys to the back while an armed maniac was still loose inside the store. Teamwork makes the dream work, right? Now we're stuck playing the quiet game, lest Ghostface defy 27 years of precedence by actually killing the main character for once. Luckily, Sam picks right now to make her one good decision for the entire movie and tosses a distraction action grenade. After all, it's only a matter of time before the cops show up, and our killer knows this. He can't just sit back and wait for them to come out like some of us should have done in the first place, meaning he'll have to go in after them if he wants any chance of wrapping this up here and now. Was Sam conscious of this when she threw the can? Probably not. I assume she was just imitating what she's seen on television, but if it works, it works, and credit where it's due. Dropping the shelf on him to cover their escape was a nice touch as well. Too bad it couldn't keep him down long enough for the boys in blue to do more than take statements for the insurance company. Down at the police station, Detective Bailey fills them in on the details surrounding the double homicide. Evidently, someone close to them must have stolen Samantha's ID and planted it at the crime scene because no question is, which of Bailey's future ex-son-in-laws did the deed? Oh, yeah, it turns out Inspector Cluso here is the father of their public transit roommate, Quinn. He must be so proud. As for how he wound up working their case, he claims it was given to him by another detective due to its tangential relationship to his daughter, but he's totally willing to give it back if that makes them uncomfortable. And my answer to that is, yes, it most certainly does. Emotionally 
uncompromised cops are the worst kind. And you know if it comes down to it, he will 100% protect his own flesh and blood over either of us. Possibly even if she was directly involved in the slayings. But like I said before, they've all but completely exhausted all their available brain power for the rest of this thing. So naturally, the thought never even crosses their minds. Kind of like when they find out the masks found at Jason's apartment and the convenience store both belong to the previous ghost faces, and neither of them immediately assumes the new killer must have connections in law enforcement. However, by some miracle, Sam manages to scrape together enough cognizance to realize they need to get the f out of Dodge like yesterday. Only there's a problem. You're both persons of interest in the double homicide, so you're not allowed to leave town, sorry. Are you serious? He's right. No, he's not right. Neither Sam nor Tara have been charged with a crime, meaning they're both free to travel at their discretion without notifying anyone. Although, please, for the love of God, if you ever find yourself in a situation even remotely similar to this, contact a lawyer as soon as you possibly can. At any rate, the real problem here is that neither of them takes the time to conduct a simple Google search, which would not only reveal that this was total BS, but also that special Special Agent Kirby is as stupid as they are, which is all the more reason to get as far away from these people as humanly possible. For real, the fact that Bailey would lie about this is supremely suspicious. Couple that with the fact that he'd have access to Sam's ID by way of Quinn and possible connections to cop buddies that could get him the ghost face gear, and I'd say it's more likely than not he's our guy. But since both girls are just gonna take him at his word, they never arrive at this conclusion. Not that they'd actually do anything about it if they did, of course. You mean to tell me that Sam is supposed to be this super paranoid character who won't even let her sister go to a house party alone, and yet, when she knows for sure she's being hunted, she doesn't even think to lie low somewhere other than her apartment. You know, the one the killer would have had to have already infiltrated in order to swipe her ID. I mean, even if you believe Bailey's line about not being able to leave town, you still have to realize New York City is a really big town. Go stay with a friend somewhere else for a while. Or better yet, bust open the we're being stalked by a murderer jar and hop around between hotels. Do literally anything besides rally at your so-called core four friend group for a slumber party and pretend pillow fights and makeovers will keep you safe. Spoiler alert, they will not. <laughs> Oh yeah, safety in numbers all right. That core four of theirs turned into a core two pretty quick. Chad and Tara left the apartment so quick they probably didn't even see the killer. Yeah, thanks for that, by the way. Oh, and then we got Miss Strong Female Lead sitting back and clutching the boo-boo on her arm while soon-to-be ex-girlfriend gets gutted right in front of her. Meanwhile, because no one thought having weapons handy could be useful in this situation, Samantha spends a good 20 seconds fumbling around in the kitchen where, surprise, surprise, all the knives have been mysteriously vanished. Man, it's almost like you should keep your tools on you when you're being hunted by a serial killer. Now, all she can do is bop them with a block and hope for the best. Although, it does seem to be fairly effective. In fact, right now is when everyone still standing should pile on top of the and smash his head into the hardwood until the neighbors complain. Instead, they all pile into one of the bedrooms where they barely reinforce the door at all, despite having nowhere else to go. I mean, I'm sure that bed is comfy to bleed on right now, but maybe try scooting that in front of the door so your survival isn't solely dependent on a single cheaply made chest of drawers. Lucky for them, Sam's secret love interest from across the alley was prepared for just such an occasion. Well, sort of. Idea. Honestly, I'm surprised she didn't ask him to throw her a butcher knife or something. Somehow, the girls managed to scoot across without having a meltdown halfway across. That is, until Annika gets a turn. I mean, in her defense, Chick's lost a ton of blood, so she's probably not thinking too clearly right now. But you've gotta believe, what's back there is going to hurt a 
hell of a lot worse than what's down below. Of course, once the killer makes it inside, it's pretty much curtains for our friend here. About the only thing we could do is tell her to hold on tight with her arms and legs wrapped through the rungs while all three of us pulled it away from the opposite wind sill. At that point, if the ladder didn't immediately snap in half under the leverage, there's a chance we might be able to reel her in unscathed. Unfortunately for her, Ghostface also gets a say in this matter. <laughs> Ooh, that's one way to dumpster dive. Probably not the greatest idea to let the girl without any blood left go last. Although, I can totally understand why no one would want to risk getting stuck behind her. Following the death of her friends, the core four, consisting of Sam, Tara, Chad, and Mindy, decide it's time to go on the offensive. And luckily, they have the power of a single FBI agent in her magic stakeout van to help them. Detective Bailey is also getting in on the action, despite the fact that he was taken off the case for bereavement following the loss of his daughter. Although, apparently, they never gave the case to anyone else because he and Kirby are literally the only two members of the law enforcement we'll interact with from here on out. I guess this is one of those ready or not type scenarios where the only cops in the entire city who actually do anything are the ones we're directly involved with. Regardless, I'd be hesitant to work with the police at all right now given there's a decent chance they've been infiltrated by the killer. And don't don't think Bailey's off the hook just because his daughter got got. Stands to reason if someone is depraved enough to do all this, they'd probably be willing to waste a family member or two that had a change of heart. As for Kirby, I don't trust her either, especially after hearing this so-called plan she slapped together. Oh sure, let's just have Sam and Tara walk through the park in broad daylight like nothing ever happened. I'm sure that totally won't look like an obvious trap at all. Of course, the plan is to use Kirby's Fedmobile to trace the signal when our man inevitably calls us to do his usual shtick. Except you're assuming he's going to call in the first place and not just casually walk by and stab them both to death. Or shoot them each in the head with a rifle from the back of a parked car. Or simply watch them from a distance and do nothing because this is clearly a setup. Also, why is Chad's rando roommate Ethan here? Dude's a total outsider who could very well be involved. As a matter of fact, Minnie's already conjectured as much, and yet she's taken all of zero action to have him excluded. Dude's probably been reporting her every move back to Ghostface this entire time. All this is to say, screw this entire half-baked operation. If we want any chance of drawing out the killer, or killers, since there's a pretty good chance we're dealing with more than one, we're going to have to make him believe he's taking us by surprise. And I think I know just how to go about this. Ordinarily, I'd say we should start things off with a trip to the nearest gun shop. But New York City maintains separate licensing requirements from the rest of the states pertaining to all modern firearms. So that's pretty much the end of that in the short term. Yet another reason we should have started working on our arsenal from day one after moving to the city. Or better yet, stayed the hell away from this cesspool. Still, we should hit up an FFL to load up on as much mace as they can legally sell us. Crossbows are also on the table, and there's nothing that says we can't buy out their stock of machetes and fighting knives while we're at it. From there, I'd book us an Airbnb somewhere off the beaten path and bring only the core four. After all, Chad and Mindy are really the only ones we can trust, but at the same time, we'll need all the help we can get. You see, the plan is to make it look like we're laying low without making it look like we're setting a trap. At this point, it's probably safe to say we're being followed everywhere we go, so he'll know we're stocking up on weapons and such. But with everything we've already been through, that's a pretty logical step for anyone in our position. Besides, given our dismal performance back at the apartment, he probably wouldn't care if we had an M60. Once we arrive at the B&B, we should immediately clear the entire house as a group to make sure we're really alone, after which we'll lock the place down and wait for one of those famous phone calls we keep getting. During this time, I'd make a few intentional OPSEC errors, like leaving my Snapchat location on. This could potentially coax Team Slasher into action by making them think we have something to exploit. For example, I could totally see them sending someone like Ethan in as a Trojan horse to scream and beg to 
be let inside. Then, all of a sudden, the killer would swoop in and hold him hostage to draw us out, only for us to get stabbed in the back. It's literally the same ploy that got Kirby a knife to the stomach, only this time, we'll totally see it coming. Right, guys? Also worth trying, although still rather risky, would be deliberately leaving a back door or window unlocked, and then camping on it with a crossbow in hopes they take the bait. That kind of entrance is a relatively standard move in the Ghostface playbook, and while we definitely can't count on these guys copying previous iterations exactly, it could very well be too tempting for them to pass up on. Fact is, they clearly think we're all a bunch of dumb and so far, we haven't really given them any reason to doubt that assessment. Obviously, the goal here is to lure the bad guys into an ambush, or at the very least, a stand-up fight against superior numbers. However, therein lies the problem with running any kind of sting operation. We have absolutely no idea how many we're up against, what they brought to play with, or how far they're willing to go. This whole stab thing is transformed into a global phenomenon at this point, so for all we know, there's an entire cabal of cinephiles out there looking to make their bones by slaying their idol's illegitimate daughter. It could even be several different groups working independent of one another. As much as I hate to admit it, the grim reality here is that our best chance for survival involves dropping off the face of the earth and never coming back. Sure, we might find a way to ice these guys, but how long until the next batch comes around? And then the next? It's only a matter of time before one eventually gets the job done. That said, knowing Sam and Tara's abhorrent lack of self-preservation instincts, they'd probably come up for air and charge straight into danger the first time one of their not friends was threatened. And in case you don't believe me, look at what happens when they find out the call is coming from Gail Weathers' apartment. Should we use the sirens? Did you really think we were going to steal a police car and not use the sirens? Did you really think you're going to make it to Gail's without seeing the inside of a jail cell? Real quick, let's review some of the reasons why this is a terrible idea. Number one, Gail might already be dead. Number two, even if she's not, what makes you think you'll be able to stop her from winding up that way? You're unarmed, and in this state, the killer was able to easily take on five of you. Oh, and let's not forget three. You're stealing a f cop car. You know they tend to get upset about that, right? Like, even if Bailey doesn't call it in, all it would take is another unit seeing a couple college girls leaping out of a lit up cruiser, and there literally wouldn't be anything you could say to keep from winding up in handcuffs. Grow a f brain for Christ's sake. Dude already knows you're working with the police, meaning he knows you know where he is, meaning this is almost certainly a ruse meant to draw you out of hiding. And even if it's not, why do you care in the first place? Gail's a self-centered yellow journalist whose shameless editorializing directly contributed to Sam's character assassination. Let her rot. Of course, unbeknownst to the girls, it turns out Gail is still alive. Although, judging by the sound of this phone call, that might might not last too long. You couldn't stop what happened to Dewey. Just like you're not gonna be able to stop this. <laughs> No way. The creepy phone call directly preceded an attack. Hey, didn't you write like several books on the stab murders? It's almost like you should have seen this coming and retreated back to a more defensible location with your boyfriend the second you know who started talking. The good news is that unlike literally everyone else we followed so far, Gale was actually somewhat prepared for this eventuality. But of course, it couldn't possibly be that easy. Like, I get practicing home carry is asking a lot, but considering her history with the various slashers that sprang up over the years and her involvement with this current round of mayhem, it's pretty reasonable to assume trouble would turn up on her doorstep sooner rather than later. Ultimately, it doesn't matter, because as long as she stays in her room while covering the only entrance, there's no way Ghostface can reach her without getting dumpstered. <sighs> However, in much the same way the bodega clerk clearly sought to terminate his own existence by stepping out into the open, Gail decides to abandon the virtually guaranteed safety of her bedroom to try and maybe end things once and for all, but probably not. And it goes pretty much exactly how you'd expect. <laughs> Yep, that checks out. Lucky for Gale, the Wonder Twins show up at exactly the right time to scoop and score with a discarded handgun. Oh, except not really, because once again, just like the clerk, Sam decides to call out to the known murderer right before firing. And what a surprise, he takes the opportunity to run away, because of course he would, you f***. 
moron. For Christ's sake, you saw firsthand just how poorly that worked out for the last guy, and yet you did it anyway. Thereby further prolonging the amount of time I'll have to spend on this steaming pile of crap they call a movie. Now, I can't exactly lay all the blame on Samantha for this. After all, she can only be as intelligent as the people who wrote the script. At any rate, now the core four plus two really, really want to go on the offensive. This time for real this time. And now it's Wednesday's turn to come up with a plan. The way she sees it, the killer will find them no matter where they go. So they might as well hold up somewhere secure where they can trap them inside. To that end, they plan to use the old abandoned movie theater Greg and Jason allegedly renovated into a shrine for all things stab related. The place is under heavy surveillance as it's believed to be linked to the murders. And there's supposedly only one way in or out. Actually, her plan isn't all that dissimilar to the one I came up with earlier. There's just a couple problems. For starters, it doesn't really come off as a place where they'd legitimately try and hide. And with as much police scrutiny as it's under, Ghostface would have had to have ghost brains not to see the trap coming a mile away. Also, the fact that there's only one way in and out isn't the slam dunk they think it is. I mean, eventually, they'll have to leave. And when they do, he'll know just where to ambush them. Sure, they're not exactly on the clock here, but he could easily set the place on fire and blindside them as they run for their lives. Of course, first, they actually have to get there, and you'll never guess how they decide to go about it. The New York subway. Because no one's ever been brutally murdered in front of dozens of people down there. Oh, and just to make things that much worse, tonight's Halloween, so not only are all the trains completely jam-packed full of drunks, a good 5% of them are dressed up as everyone's favorite lunatic. There's no actual way you could all be this dumb. Just call an Uber XL, my god. At least then, you might be able to tell if you're being followed. Plus, because some people simply aren't assertive enough to shove their way aboard in a life or death situation, Mindy ends up getting left behind with Ethan, who she's just super fond of. Although, that turns out to be the least of her problems. <laughs> Well, that figures. Honestly, I'm surprised just the one of them got stabbed. Fortunately, Ethan was nearby to drag her onto the platform and get help on the way. So you know she's going to make a full recovery. Also, remember this moment for a few minutes from now. If you're like me, it's really gonna piss you off. As for the rest of the party, they all make it to the theater without any problems, just in time for Sam to send Mr. Love Interest packing because he can't be trusted all of the sudden. Okay, I get that it's really supposed to be a romantic gesture to keep him from getting killed, but then you realize she dragged him all this way, only to let him walk home by himself after being seen with her on multiple separate occasions. So, yeah. Good luck, bro. Anyway, now that they're all inside, Sam decides she she needs to leave the rest of the group in order to call Mindy for some reason, which then prompts everyone else to go their separate ways. I know. All I can say is, I hope Kirby went through this place with a fine-toothed comb beforehand. Otherwise, none of us will live to see Scream 7's direct-to-streaming release date. Then again, it seems we might still be hosed either way. Get everyone out of there, Sam. You're not safe. They fired Kirby two months ago for being mentally unstable. Wow, that sucks, especially since she not only has the only firearm, but also the only key to the exit. Good thing we all immediately forgot about her as soon as we walked in. If this is true, we need to regroup with the others and arm up fast. Fortunately, there's no shortage of knives lying around, but as history has shown, bringing a knife to a gunfight is not a recipe for long-term survival. Without knowing the layout of this place, I say we should try to get up to the balcony to get a better view of the entire theater. And since the only way up is through the hallway, we could post guards at the entrance for an ambush if she tries to come after us. And when Scream Guy comes in for a close-up, we need to remain committed to extreme violence until he or she is pretty much just just a puddle. And by that, I mean finish your god kills. Seriously, Chad knocks old Ghosty on his twice, and in both cases, everyone just scurries away like they're not hopelessly trapped in here. All it would have taken is a few well-placed stomps at the right time, and we wouldn't be nearly as screwed once the second one shows up. <laughs>
bummer. Yeah, it's definitely not looking good for Sam and Tara right now. But once again, an armed third party wards off the attackers at the last second without actually hitting them. Turns out Kirby got knocked out by one of the killers because of course she did. Although for some reason they neglected to finish her off or at the very least separate her from her handgun. Oh, and surprise, surprise, she wasn't the big bad after all. That honor goes to none other than the obvious Detective Bailey, which we can tell by the fact that he doesn't stupidly warn Kirby before absolutely smoking her. And the twists don't stop there. Just look who we have under the hoods. It seems Quinn's death was nothing more than fake blood in a body double, and apparently a woefully incompetent medical examiner. As for Ethan, remember what I said about the subway scene? Think about it. Dude had literally no reason to try and save Mindy's life. Like, zero. After all, none of them were around for him to deceive. He could have just hung out on the opposite side of the train and pretended he had no idea what went down. You know, like everyone else in the city. Whatever. I'm getting distracted. Ultimately, the biggest reveal of them all is their motivation for all of this. You see, they aren't just fans of the franchise. It's in the family. As we find out, Bailey is actually the father of Sam's psychotic ex, Richie, and Ethan and Quinn are his brother and sister. Naturally, all of this is relayed to our heroes in explicit detail, giving Kirby enough time to shake off the blunt force trauma and implement everyone's favorite trope of the bulletproof vest. <laughs> Recognize this? <laughs> Jesus, dude, does literally everything have to be a callback to previous killers? How about instead of sticking her in the abdomen where she's already survived it once before, you try the heart or face or something else? At least then Sam might think twice before callously yanking it out of her and using it to f your day up. Nah, let's be real. She would have done it no matter where he stuck that blade. Never mind the fact that there was a perfectly good handgun lying right next to Kirby we could have used to finish off the cursed family tree without bleeding her completely dry. Instead, we're going to just assume they're all down for the count and start climbing up a bunch of rickety old scaffolding towards an ancient exit sign that probably doesn't lead anywhere. I mean, sure, we could ask Kirby for the key to the known exit down on ground level, but how else would we end up with this crazy cliffhanger sequence with Tara dangling over certain death. Meanwhile, Detective Bailey could easily shoot either of them right now, and yet he chooses not to for no discernible reason. I get you want to send them off the same way Sam did Richie in, but you know you can still stab them to death after you shoot them, right? Okay, this is taking way too long, so let me give you the spark notes. Sam lets go of Tara so she can pull some death from above type on Ethan, who's just been staring up at her like a trained dog. I guess this is supposed to represent Sam accepting her sister can take care of herself or something? I don't know. As for Quinn, Sam just blows her brains out, which, if I had to guess, represents the feeling most people had after walking out of the theater. Or maybe just the serious head trauma it took to actually green light this nightmare. Whatever the case, it sets the stage for what is quite possibly the dumbest final showdown I've seen in my entire life. Let's take a look. Yeah, let me just break that down for any mouth breathers out there. Dude charges her with his loaded gun outstretched like a lance. Because why? To make the bullets go faster, obviously. Only he was too late on the trigger. The fool. If only he had realized how horrifically stupid that would look. Then maybe he would have just run a simple Mozambique and lived to pin this entire mess on the girl everyone already thinks is crazy. Instead, he suddenly finds himself waking up at a pool of his own shame, and just in time to take one final phone call. With an all too familiar voice on the other end. Nah, we're done here. It's Sam. She's got the voice changer thing, and she's gonna stab him a bunch after he wastes all his ammunition shooting mannequin heads. And with that, Sam, Tara, and Kirby leave the theater to rejoin their friends, who are all totally still alive, by the way. Yup, Mindy's fine, Gail's fine, even Chad is completely fine after being thoroughly worked over by Ethan and Quinn. Everyone is just fine, except Annika, who's still dead as in the end, pretty much everyone on Team Samantha made it out alive. However, had the girls called Bailey on his BS back at the police station and skipped town immediately, there's a pretty good chance they could have avoided the entire ordeal that followed. For that reason, I think Scream 6 was beaten. Moral of the story, warn the bad guys after you shoot them. <laughs>